right. That's great. So I am yep. delighted to meet Sydney. Um, she <laughs> came and approached, you approached us about the, yes. the, yeah, the bee box. Yep. And so we have a bee box out there in the, the garden, which you guys, you can actually see it on the other side of the picnic table. Not with live bees in it. Not with Don't live worry. bees. Yeah, I should, should mention that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's safe. And, um, and so um, she and our director, Rachel Muse, oh, I should always introduce myself, I always forget. Judy Byron, Judy, I know who I am. Judy with an I. Sorry, that's a lot And I'm the adult program coordinator. I manage adults, no. <laughs> um, programs at the library here. And so anyway, Sydney and Rachel, um, we're collaborating, we thought, hey, do, having a bee program would be wonderful. So this is the first, maybe, we might do another one in the spring, we'll yeah. see. Um, and Sydney is a student at UVM, she is uh, in the ecological, agricultural, uh, agriculture and animal mm -hmm. science, I have oh. to speak slowly. And she, um, she, her experience involves agricultural operations practices that impact wild populations and natural ecosystems. She's also the head lab and field <laughs> technician um, for the Vermont Bee Labs di Diagnostic Services and various research projects. And I know you're gonna talk about some of those. Yes. Um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, but she focuses on honeybee pests and diseases, and we'll talk about some of that tonight. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about the amazing lives of honeybees um, and the beekeeping industry, um, about the drivers of global pollinator decline, as well as what we do in the Vermont Bee Lab to support the local beekeeping community um, here in Vermont. Um, so yes, as Judy mentioned, my name is Sydney Miller. Um, I am speaking on behalf of the research professor at the Vermont Bee Lab, Dr. Samantha Alger. Um, so she's my boss, um, but I've been the lead technician there since 2021 um, and uh, manage the day-to-day -day operations um, at the lab and our field work as well. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so here we are. Here's um, me doing some field work um, with the bees. So the Vermont Bee Lab is located on UVM campus. Um, we're dedicated to the protection of both wild and managed pollinators, but we focus mostly on pest and diseases um, related to honeybees. Um, so we conduct research, we engage in public outreach events, and um, we provide educational opportunities as well. Whereabouts in UVM? Um, it's in the Jeffords building. Yeah, I actually have a picture later. Um, but first, I'll kind of go through like the lives, just give you some context about honeybees um, and the beekeeping industry, and then kind of go into you know the threats of honeybees, and then about what we do in the lab. Um, so I'd like to emphasize that while I will be mainly talking about honeybees, um, there are thousands of other bee species um, globally that many people don't even recognize, um, but which serve very important ecological roles um, in our environment. So a lot of the threats to honeybees um, also impact these creatures as well. And there have been over 300 species identified just in Vermont. Um, so yes, but I will be focusing mainly on the honeybee, which is on the next slide. I'm trying. <laughs> Don't know why it works sometimes, it does. I know, it's finicky. Back to this. Okay. Maybe not. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So, this is the honeybee that we all know and love. Um, you know, it's important to emphasize that this is not a native species to the United States. Um, it was imported from Europe around the time of colonization as a livestock animal, and most people don't realize um, that bees really are a livestock animal, but they do come in direct contact with our plant animal communities um, in the environment and they are today's most important crop pollinator. Yes, next. Um, so I'd like to define just a couple terms that I'll be using um, frequently throughout the presentation and that sometimes get mixed up in our day-to-day -day language. Um, so a, col a colony is in the superorganism of the honeybee um, containing all of the honeybees that are all genetically related. Um, the hive is the structure that the colony resides in, and an apiary is a collection of honeybee colonies in their hives. 
Um, and it's an also important to note that beekeeping is not a modern practice. Um, humans have had a relationship with honeybees since the dawn of civilization. And this is just an example of a very ancient cave painting depicting someone um, robbing feral honeybees um, for their honey, which was really the main source of sugar um, and preserved food product and really was a game changer for humans. Um, so we've been doing this a long time and while back then they were mostly bee hunting, um, we have now figured out a way to to really build a relationship with these animals and manage them ourselves. So it was around the 1850s um, when Reverend Langstroth uh, discovered um, and designed the modern beehive, um, which is termed the Langstroth hive appropriately. Um, so this enables the beekeeper to easily access and manipulate the colony without harming the bees or their brood nest. Um, so I'll just kind of, it's made up of several components. So I'll kind of go through like how it works. Um, so at the bottom um, right here is where the bees will enter their hive. Um, the f each, each box on top of the entrance is called a super. And the first super is typically deeper um, and that's where the bees will be raising their offspring. Each super above that will typically be shallower and that's what, where they will store nectar and convert it into honey for their winter food stores. Um, what's interesting about the Langstroth hive is that it's specifically designed um, for the honeybee's preference in what's called bee space. Um, and bee space has been found to be exactly three-eighths of an inch, and it's what honeybees build their comb. Even in, this is an example of um, a feral honeybee colony, and they build all of their corridors at this exact width. So between each frame in a Langstroth hive um, will be exactly three-eighths of an inch um, to keep the bees happy. So this has been a game changer for the beekeeping industry um, and is what most uh, modern beekeepers are using today. Sydney, that looks like a flower. I know, it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's really good. And every time, I mean, it's incredible. Every time you go into a hive, it's just, um, it's like putting together a puzzle of like what the bees are thinking. Um, it's just really beautiful, yeah. Um, so bee, honeybees go through what's called metamorphosis, similar to many butterflies and other insects. Um, this is composed of four distinct life stages. So the queen bee will lay an egg, which will develop into a larva, which is the second stage of life. Then it will develop into a pupa, where the, a worker bee will cap the pupa over um, with wax and while it pupates, and then it emerges as a young adult bee. Next. Yes, yes, um, and actually, yeah, I'll go into them more later. Um, yeah, so each um, member of the honeybee colony actually has a different developmental cycle. It takes a certain amount of days and different amounts of days for different um, members of the colony to develop. So they're composed of three different members, although there are, you know, up to upwards of 15,000 bees in a colony, um, although there is only one queen bee per colony. Um, the drones are the male bees, and their sole responsibility is to mate with queens. So um, once and then they die. So once a year, um, the drones will flee the nest. Um, they get kicked out, yeah. <laughs> and they um, congregate in what's called mating flights um, somewhere in the, the woods. Um, and queens from all over, from different colonies, will congregate with the males. And one queen will mate with up to 10, or 10 to 14 drones, which will serve as the only sperm that she uses to lay thousands of eggs a day over the course of her lifetime, which can be um, you know, two to three years. Um, so there's only one queen per hive. Um, the queen's sole responsibility is to uh, produce all of the offspring. So every bee in a colony is all genetically related to the queen. Um, the worker bees are the female bees, and while they are not able to um, lay eggs because they're, they're not fully reproductively mature, um, they are responsible for essentially every other task in the hive, such as cleaning, um, building honeycomb, foraging for resources, um, and feeding the developing uh, brood. So what's interesting about a worker bee um, is that during her adult phase, which only lasts a month, um, she actually has pre prescribed tasks at different, uh, age, at different ages of her adult life. So when she first emerges as a young adult, um, she will be responsible for feeding the younger brood. 
She will then, um, her wax glands, which are located underneath her abdomen, will fully mature um, at around 10 days. And she will then be able to start producing wax and manipulating it with her mandibles to create that quintessential um, honeybee hexagonal comb arrangement um, that they build their nest with. And they not only uh, raise brood in those cells, but also store honey in those cells and pollen. Um, so then later in life, she will be responsible for guarding the entrance of her hive against intruders. And then for about the last 10 days of her life, she will for take her first flight out of the hive and begin foraging. So the bees that you see flying around are at the end of their life. Aww. Yeah, and um, because it's a dangerous job out there to go forage for uh, food resources. So they don't want to waste um, the, the strong young adults. Yeah, send them off, <laughs> send them off. they do their duties. So what are the beads foraging for? Um, does anyone have any ideas? Pollen. You know, just call them out. Pollen. pollen, yes, I heard pollen. Anything else? Nectar, yes. Anything else? We can go to the next slide. That is such a great picture. Yeah, so many good bee that. pictures. <laughs> So they're foraging for not only nectar and pollen, um, but also propolis and water. Um, but I'll kind of go through all of these things. So nectar is a reward that flowers produce um, to attract pollinators in order to pollinate them. Um, unbeknownst to the bee, the flower ends up covering the bee with pollen, which it then transfers to the next flower. Um, but the bee is really looking for the nectar at the center of the flower, and she, that is what um, she brings back to the hive um, to convert into honey, which will serve as their winter food stores. Um, she will also collect pollen. So pollen is the plant's male reproductive cell. Um, it's also packed with nutrients. So they'll actually convert it into uh, this fermented paste called bee bread and feed it to the younger brood um, since it has proteins and vitamins and fats, um, super nutritious. And they will also collect propolis, which naturally is excreted from plants from the bark um, as like plant sap or resin. Um, and this they use for its waterproof um, capabilities. So bees will actually line the inside, the interior of their hive with a thin layer of propolis um, to keep the water out. And it's also been proven to have antimicrobial properties which may serve a role in um, protecting the colony against bacterial or fungal infestations. Um, and lastly, just like us, uh, bees need water to consume, but also to cool their hive um, during the hot summer days. So why keep bees in the first place? Like, what do they provide to humans? Any ideas? Honey. Honey. <laughs> yes. Anything else? They pollinate. They pollinate. Yes, absolutely. Any other ideas? No? All right, well, we can go to the next slide. So yes, honey, everybody knows that, um, that bees, that honeybees produce honey. Um, we can go to the next slide. But how exactly is honey made? And many people don't know exactly how it's made. Um, so honey is made from nectar. Um, the younger, the bees will bring the nectar back and they actually, as they collect it, store it in what's called their honey stomach. Um, and they regurgitate it into a honey cell. Um, in the top supers, and they will, oh, this time of year, clover flowers are the main source of nectar. Um, so once it's been regurgitated into this cell, she'll go through two separate processes to basically evaporate the water out and increase the sugar content um, in the nectar, which uh, preserves it. So the active ripening process is where she will blow bubbles um, into the nectar to increase evaporation, which also incorporates enzymes from her own body, which start to ferment the sugars in the nectar. Um, and then she'll also fan her wings over the nectar, which also increases evaporation. So once it's considered ripe, um, the worker bee will cap it over, the honey cell over with wax, and then it is fully preserved and summer um, honey that they've you know, converted nectar to honey, it'll last them all the way through winter. And it'll last us years, like honey, will, honey is a very preserved product and will last a very long time. It's quite incredible. 
So this is the way that um, beekeepers extract honey. So this is what a frame might look like, um, a honey frame that has been completely capped over by the worker bees. Um, so this is all these cells are containing honey. This is what it looks like once the beekeeper has uncapped those in order to extract the honey from the cells. Um, the honey frames are then placed in what's called an extractor, and this spins um, and through centrifugal force expels uh, the honey from the cells, which uh, drains to the bottom and is strained and, and then packaged for sale. Um, and that's where you're getting your honey in the stores. Um, so a single colony can produce up to 200 pounds of honey in a year and typically only consume around 40 to 50 pounds throughout the winter. So there's actually a lot of honey left over um, so that the beekeeper can extract it without harming the bees or stealing their energy reserves. Other products that bees provide to us, um, beeswax, which I mentioned the bees literally make um, which like I had no idea that it was it's incredible, um, and obviously we use it you know for its waterproof abilities as an oil um, and for burning, uh, and then bee pollen as well. It's just as nutritious to us it is, as it is to developing brood, um, and it's considered a power food you can buy in most supermarkets. Highly suggest you try it. Um, it tastes like chalky floral deliciousness, um, and it's super nutritious. So. It's um, packed with protein, um, protein and like some vitamins. I think I'm not 100% sure on the. And how do you eat it? Do you put it on? <clears throat> you can put it in smoothies. You can put it like on yogurt. Um, yeah, you can just incorporate it into like yeah any. Or you can just yeah, or you can just eat it. Yeah, you can just <laughs> eat it. Put it on ice cream, like <laughs> any really anything. <laughs> yeah, and then of course. Honeybees, their main purpose for humans raising them is for their pollination services, um, contributing $17 billion to the U.S. agricultural system annually. Um, so they're today's most important crop pollinator. <clears throat> and maybe you've seen an image like this. Um, this is what our grocery store looks like with the help of honeybees, and then what it might look like without honeybees. And you can see that around 75% of the fruits and vegetables that we love um, would be excluded without the role that honeybees play in pollination. Um, so much of the beekeeping industry is considered migratory. So this means that uh, beekeepers literally truck thousands of colonies across the United States on different routes, um, you know, hitting different farms at different times that are growing different crops, um, you know, at different times of year uh, for their pollination services. So farmers will hire beekeepers um, to pollinate their crops. Um, and this is a major source of revenue for beekeepers. You would think honey would be, but it's not. So honey is a very small part of the revenue that beekeepers make. Um, and about half of the commercial bee colonies that are in the U.S. as of now are used in uh, migratory operations. Um, and that's, we have 2.6 million colonies in the United States. So it's, I mean, it's a huge industry. Um, and most people don't even know, you know, that that's, that's why their vegetables are on the shelf is literally because of bees. Um, yep. There, yeah, that, yes. They'll literally they'll move them um, at night so that the bees like are all home. Um, they'll literally close the the entrance to the hives, um, load them on a truck, and ship them all over. And then they'll en import them. You know, farmers hire to import their bees, um, and then two weeks later they move on to the next farm after the bloom is over. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna talk about it. Okay, so this is what an almond plantation might look like. This is kind of um, like almonds are like a major source of pollination, uh, completely reliant on honeybees. Um, so while this looks beautiful and abundant while it's in bloom, this only lasts for two weeks out of the year in March. And you can imagine this being an incredibly harsh environment for any other insect um, because once all these trees are finished blooming, this is essentially a food desert, um, which excludes all wild pollinators um, that could be assisting in pollination services um, from helping because the rest of the year they would be starved. Um, 
So, you know, through intensive agricultural operations, we've become solely reliant on this managed livestock animal of the honeybee to provide these pollination services. Um, in addition to having like a limited floral resource, they're also coming in contact with pesticides that are sprayed on the almonds. I'm using almonds um, as an example, but this applies to, you know, many different um, operations. And they're also bees from all over the country are mingling and so transmitting viruses from one another across flowers similar to the way we transmit viruses through doorknobs um, it works the same way and so you know this is really detrimental to the bees well-being and health overall so now i get into the honeybee pandemic and we've all heard the slogan save the bees um, and it's true that the honeybees are having a really hard time. Um, and it's not because of one issue, um, it's they're succumbing to a combination of stressors. Um, can you move to the next slide? <laughs> and I'm moving no, quickly. Okay. I'm just slow. <laughs> um, so this is just an image of kind of the hot spots in Vermont for colony loss. Um, in Vermont alone, we're losing upwards of 40% of our colonies every year. Um, of, from beekeepers of all operation types, not just commercial beekeepers. And in last year's Bee Informed Partnership Survey, which surveys about 7% of um, the entire honeybee population in the country, um, they reported 45.5% colony loss, which has been the highest in history. Um, so we're continuing on a trajectory of population decline, um, and so something that really needs attention drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Meaning the farmer will come out and the bees will yeah, and yep, they're mostly dying after winter. Um, and you know, if they have pesticides in, you know, the nectar that they're collecting, um, that could be a reason why they die. They die because of pests and diseases that kind of grow exponentially, like over the winter, um, and also because of climate. But really, it's just the bees are stressed, and so it's hard for them to survive over winter. Um, Bees are actually the only, one of the only insects that stay alive all winter long. Most insects go through some sort of hibernation period um, during the winter, but bees um, like literally vibrate, cluster around their queen and vibrate to stay warm all winter, so they have to be constantly consuming honey throughout the winter. Um, so because of this, yeah, it's hard for them to survive. You know, I don't have an answer for that, honestly. Um, you know, maybe it's due to like more inexperienced beekeepers. Maybe there's like more like, greater concentration of commercial beekeepers in those areas. Um, there definitely are. Yeah, I don't know why um, Orleans County is really bad. I really don't know. Um, so, like I said. Uh, Bees are succumbing to a variety of stresses. There's many things that are threatening them, um, which, which ultimately leads to colony loss. And this doesn't solely apply to um, or concern honeybees, uh, but rather you know, all species of pollinator that you know, could be assisting in our pollination services um, and for other ecological roles as well. Um, so limited floral resources, so as more natural woodland and um, meadowlands are converted into intensive agricultural operations, um, the fewer floral resources and the less diversity the bees have to access um, for their food. They're also coming in contact with a whole slew of um, pesticides. Uh, Vermont is actually in the process of passing the H626 bill, um, which is, at, I believe it's in the Senate as of now, um, and I don't know if it's going to get passed or not, but it's uh, an effort to ban the sale of neonicotinoid pesticides in the state. Um, neo, maybe you've heard of neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, they've been pretty like publicized in the media lately. Um, for their harmful effect to bees in particular. Um, the problem with neonicotinoids is that they're a systemic pesticide. So a seed, for example, let's say corn, a seed is treated with the pesticide um, before the pest outbreak is even present. So they're treated prophylactically. Um, 
once the seed is planted and the plant has sprouted, uh, the pesticide will be present in all tissues of the plant and be expressed. So not only is it expressed in the foliage or the fruit which the pests may be consuming, but it will also be present in the nectar and pollen which the bees are consuming, um, which is very problematic. Um, they have also, you know, are coming in contact with a whole variety um, of pests and diseases, uh, parasites, pathogens, um, which the Vermont Bee Lab mainly focuses on, so I'll go more into. And the pests and diseases I'll be mentioning um, are specific to honeybees. This is not to wild pollinators. Okay, so maybe you've heard of Varroa mites. Um, they have become the most devastating pest in modern beekeeping, and most beekeepers are reporting that their leading cause of colony loss um, is Varroa mite infestations. Go to the next slide. So this is what Varroa mites look like. Um, their full name is Varroa destructor, which is quite appropriate. Um, they are an ectoparasite, which means that they attach themselves to the outside of the bee and consume their internal hemolymph, which is essentially their blood, and their fat bodies throughout their lifetime, um, while also transmitting lethal viruses, similar to the way that ticks transmit Lyme's disease to us. Um, although the size difference between a tick and us is quite different than uh, a bromite versus a bee. I mean, they are massive in comparison to their host. Um, so it not only suppresses uh, the bee's immune system, um, but weakens the bee overall, um, and also inflicts them during development. This is an example of deformed wing virus, which is transmitted by varroa mites, and the bees will, young adult bees will literally emerge looking like that with shriveled up wings, unable to participate um, you know, in the functioning of the colony as a whole. So it weakens the colony um, and, and leads to colony death. So these are not a native pesticide, uh, pest, uh, nor are honeybees native, um, but they were imported from Eastern Asia and first discovered in uh, U.S. honeybee colonies in the 1980s. And since then, they have caused devastating effects to the industry. Um, beekeepers kind of have <laughs> coined the phrase, they're no longer beekeepers, but bee replacers. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as of now, they are found in every single honeybee colony um, in the United States and globally, um, maybe except a few in Australia, but they will be there soon. They are quite a pervasive pest. Is there a way to get rid of them? Yes, there is a way. Um, but mainly beekeepers have been reliant, completely reliant on chemical controls. And the problem with chemical controls is that resistance ends up developing and there's already been massive amounts of resistance already like being shown in honeybee colonies um, with varroa mites. So that's part of what the Vermont Bee Lab does is try to find alternative ways to combat um, this pest, which is kind of the priority for beekeepers as of now um, and just destroying the industry. So the reason why varroa mites are such a, such a successful pest um, is because their life cycle follows that of the honeybee. So queen bee will lay her egg. Um, this is a worker bee feeding the larva. Um, she may have a varroa mite ar already on her. If a female, mite, a female mite will enter a developing larva's cell, and once the cell is capped over for the larva to begin to pupate, she will then lay her offspring in the cell. Um, her offspring will then attach themselves to the pupa um, and begin to feed, or they will, once the adult bee has emerged, either with bromites already attached to her, or there will be uh, bromites left over that will be free crawling to climb onto another adult bee. And you can imagine this happening over thousands of cells in a colony. I mean, the population just grows exponentially over the course of the bee season. So now a little bit about the Vermont Bee Lab and what we do to help mitigate these numerous threats um, to honeybees, at least in the Vermont area. So we're funded um, through the Vermont Agency of Agriculture um, and also in coordination with the Vermont Beekeepers Association. Go to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know, it's, a, it's a constant scroll. <laughs> I didn't want to make it too long. So we're located in the Jeffords building. This is just an image of our lab. I can continue. 
And our main service that we provide to all Vermont beekeepers free of charge um, for, for any beekeeper looking to evaluate the health of their colonies um, is diagnostic work. So beekeepers who have either had a dead out colony, you know, in the spring they find their colonies have died, um, or may suspect that their colony is being inflicted by a certain disease, um, will send us a sample of their bees, which we will then analyze and then report back with a diagnosis, um, which can inform their treatment regimens and their future management practices. Um, it's been around for three years now. This is our third season working with, yeah. And last year, so last year was our second season um, providing diagnostic services, and we saw a 50% increase in, in beekeeper participation, um, which we're trying to continue that you know, trajectory this, this season. Um, we analyzed over 100 samples last year, um, which represented 34 apiaries across 27 towns. So we're really getting a breadth of data, um, which is showing us the distribution of pests and diseases in Vermont and helping us to gauge where um, best to, to focus our efforts. And yes, um, so in addition, so beekeepers can either ship us their samples um, or they can drop them off at one of our local drop boxes. We've actually um, increased, expanded the number of drop boxes um, to include almost all counties in the state. So we've recently um, installed one here at the Waterbury Library, which is um, one of the reasons I'm speaking today, which is so great. And this is for maximum convenience um, for the beekeeper to deliver samples to our lab um, so they can drop them off their samples off there and um, the samples will be delivered to the lab. Yep. <laughs> and then I'll just describe um, a few of our other research, ongoing research projects um, that we've been conducting over the past few years. Um, one of our most recent uh, studies has been in partnership with Mike Palmer who is a very well-known commercial beekeeper in northern Vermont. Um, and he's had a bee breeding program for the past like 50 years, um, but we're partnering with him to leverage, uh, leverage our lab's diagnostic services um, in order to monitor his colonies um, for pests and diseases and to better inform his bee breeding um, program. So we're essentially selecting for uh, disease resistance and also climate adaptability localized to the Northeast. Um, many bees that are in Vermont currently are actually imported from more Southern states. So obviously this genetic stock isn't, you know, our environment here, wet, cold, is just not conducive to those bees. So we're really trying to bolster the, the genetic stock that's here in Vermont. Um, oh no, you can keep it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're also doing, I have to go through all of them. Um, so we're actually piloting a program this year where we're testing for hygienic behavior and we're working with um, three commercial bee breeders in Vermont now. Um, hygienic behavior is a trait that some genetic bee stock uh, exhibits and basically the worker bees are able to detect if, um, through odors, if a a brood is compromised in any way, if there's a varroa mite in there, if it's diseased, um, and they will physically remove the brood from the hive, um, kind of creating disease resistance and cleanliness overall. So this trait is obviously desirable, um, and so we've been testing um, the, these beekeepers' bees for this trait to also help their breeding program and to kind of target the source of the genetic bee stock that's being disseminated across the state. Um, we've also been a proxy for the National Honeybee Survey here in Vermont. This is a nationwide program facilitated by the USDA, um, but we, um, we manage it here in Vermont. And similar to our diagnostic services, this is testing for diseases um, and, and pests present in Vermont apiaries, as well as pesticide residues found in the nectar or pollen. Um, so this allows us to see a distribution not only in Vermont, but on a much broader scale across the country. Um, and then lastly, we uh, started a honeybee forage project recently, these past two seasons, where we've been collecting samples from both nectar and pollen and profiling them to genetically identify which plants the bees are collecting at which times of year. Um, this is a super exciting project because this hasn't been done since like the 1980s. Um, and this really shows like what the bees are preferring at different times of year. You know, for the beekeepers, it's like which plants are most economically important. And it's also showing us um, 
how exactly the bees are interacting with our native environment. <clears throat> so what can you do to support the honeybees? Um, and many people think that if you want to save the bees, you should get bees and manage bees. And while beekeeping is an incredibly rewarding experience, and I highly suggest that you do get bees, um, it's crucial to take the proper steps to educate yourself on the complexities um, and you know, to avoid causing more harm than good um, to the wild populations of bees. Um, next. So what you can do um, for sure without you know, purchasing bees uh, is to you know, plant tons of flowering plants in your garden or yard. Um, you know, avoid using pesticides to get rid of, you know, unwanted weeds. Um, the weeds, bees actually love weeds, so, you know, don't mow them and kind of redefine what uh, a beautiful manicured yard looks like in support of bees. Um, you can also do a fun project like build a wild bee hotel with um, <laughs> various size hollow reeds, which uh, native bees love to nest in. Um, yeah, and support your local beekeeper, you know, buy local honey, um, come in contact with them, you know, shadow them for a day. Um, many beekeepers are like so excited to share their love of bees and their experience um, and inform them of our lab's services. And, you know, if you are interested in getting bees one day, I highly suggest it. They're amazing creatures um, and there's, you know, a proper way to beekeep so that you're not spreading pests and diseases. Um, so we do offer introductory courses every year, um, which both UVM and non-UVM students can participate in. So uh, they occur in the spring and the summer. Um, so they, you know, walk you through the basics of beekeeping and the industry um, and, you know, management practices. So this would be a really great way to, like, introduce yourself um, to keeping bees. That's a great photo on the right. Yes, that's, um, <laughs> actually, we're, like, grafting queens. And now we're like rearing queens with that. So the bees are the bees are um, making tons of queen cells with wow. that, which we can then yeah make new lots of new colonies. <clears throat> so once you've taken a class, you know maybe you've shouted with the beekeeper, um, you feel confident that you're ready to get bees. Um, we've actually just published a catalog on our website that has every bee supplier in the state. It has tons of information about each one of them, um, such as characteristics that they're selecting for, um, you know, and when the best timing is to uh, order, place your order for bees. So definitely check that out if you're ever interested in purchasing your bees. <coughs> and you can also get involved with our lab um, by sending us bee samples or telling your beekeeping friends to send us their samples. Um, visit our website. We always are hosting events, um, and we have tons of online resources uh, for you to browse. We also are fairly active on social media, um, so follow us if you'd like. Um, we try to stay up to date with our field activities uh, throughout the season, and as always, you can donate to our lab on our website. That's all I have all for right. you. I want to thank the Waterbury <laughs> Library for having me tonight. I'm happy to try to answer them, but yeah. We just put up a, a bee house. Yes, a bee hotel. A very small bee yes. hotel. A bee yes, hotel. <laughs> um, that's great. Now, when I put it up, I read the instructions and it said, like, put it in a place where they would get the morning sun so they yep. could warm up. And, and we have very few places where the sun hits our house where we can also watch the bees yeah so i put it up <laughs> just a yep. few days ago i haven't no activity yet yeah but i before i put it up i i found that a bee had taken residence in a in a receptacle that i had for a for a grounded plug and they've taken <laughs> residence. they said this, i don't want your this hotel little mason, <laughs> this little mason bee had capped over yeah the the uh grounded section yes. of the plug, the little round <laughs> section of the plug. So I was anticipating we'd start to see that kind of bee, which I guess is also a important pollinator. Oh, it's definitely. not a honeybee per se. No. And I, I guess I was wondering, it's it's close to where we enter the house. Is is that a problem for bees if we have it in an area where there's a little traffic? 
foot traffic? Or? I mean, if they've chosen to put their nest there, then obviously they don't mind. Mason bees in particular are super docile. They are like so unlikely to sting. So right. if you're comfortable with having them well, there. I, and we're comfortable. I had to convince my daughter-in-law that they and, wouldn't and if they're sting comfortable, her. Then are you talking about the bee hotel? Are you talking about yeah. where they... Um, yeah. Well, I guess you'll just have to experiment with it. You could place it there, see if you get any action. I mean, they may not, you know, like the constant traffic, but right. you could definitely try it. But I don't see any reason why that would be, you know, harmful to the bee in any way. And the other question I had was about maintenance. What do I do yep. with that in the winter? You can, I mean, if you want to put it inside, they'll usually, um, I don't think they live like over winter. So you can bring it inside if it's, you know, if they fled. And then clean it out. Clean it out completely. You can just leave spring? it. If if the bees want to use it, they'll clean it out themselves and use it. Oh, okay. Um, so honestly, you can just leave it outside. Yeah, that's my kind of bee. Because I mean, out in nature, it's like you know they're self sufficient. They find you know little nooks and crannies to to okay. nest in. So honestly, you can just leave it outside, and and the more permanent it is, I bet you know the more willing they would be to nest. No, a honeybee won't come to that. Kind no, of. because the honey honeybees are generally since they're. Mason bees have a lot smaller colonies um, than honeybees. Honeybees are typically, if they're feral honeybee colonies, which there are, like in our woods and stuff, um, they'll typically look for like an old uh, tree trunk or you know hole in a rock or something, something like much bigger than than a little reed. They also build their nests differently. Like a lot of native bees will build their cells, um, like if this is the reed, they'll build their cells like this instead of the honeybees are building a flat surface with lots of cells in it. So they'll build like a tunnel instead. Um, so it just depends on the bee species, but you could also like read up on, you know, on the native bee species around here and yeah, and just then you'd know mm -hmm. what to best provide for them. Yeah. But that's awesome that you set up a bee hotel. Yes. Bumblebee question. Okay, I'll try my best to answer. I'm like not great about, um, but I can also get back to you if I don't know the answer. My uh, Samantha Alger has done lots of research with honeybees or with bumblebees, so okay. she would um, know. This um, maybe last month, I there was a bumblebee on my back um, porch that had glassed in, you know, uh, bouncing oh, off hitting the, the glass, <laughs> and, and I tried to coax him to go outside. In the evening, I saw four bumblebees in there. Um, the next day, they were sleeping on the roll-up shade. They were in the <laughs> reed. They were- They must really like your porch. And, uh, there, were, <laughs> there were more than a dozen. And wow. I, yeah. Yeah, that is very interesting me. behavior. Yeah, you got a bee hotel. <laughs> yeah, you didn't even know it. <laughs> But, that is um, so funny. I, I thought they looked like they were sleeping, and do bees sleep at night, and then when it warms up, yep. they, they wake up and yep. start. Which they definitely do. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I have not heard about it. I've actually recently, a lot of people have been emailing the lab like with just strange bee behavior, and you know, I'm wondering like if it has something to do with you know neuro neurological like problems with pesticide exposure or something mm -hmm. to that nature. It also, there are a lot of bees that look like bumblebees and aren't necessarily, because bumblebees are pretty solitary. Um, they will, a queen bumblebee will build like a very small nest, um, but then she'll overwinter by herself. Um, so I'm not sure why 12 bumblebees would be together, but I can, I'm happy to ask Samantha and okay. yeah, um, I'll, if you want to yeah, like give me your email actually, or something, I can get back. That, is there an entomologist that, uh, is that who Samantha is? She's, or? yeah, she's the bee lady at UVM. Okay. Yeah, she knows everything bees. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> she's been my mentor. She is the bee lady. <laughs> 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 yes, but I will definitely get back to you. But they were enjoying the lilacs and- <laughs> Yes, and lilacs. Oh my gosh, the bees go crazy yeah, for lilacs. They do be really busy that yes. night. Yeah, it's actually been, this year has been um, a super nectar flow, like more than many years past. Um, and kind of like nectar flow kind of oscillates like different different years. Um, so it's interesting. This year has been crazy for the beekeepers. Bees are bringing in so much nectar. Good. How do you measure nectar flow? Um, in weight. So, I mean, the the beekeepers will, will weigh um, the supers that the nectar is stored in. Um, and so they also have to, 
Beekeepers have to add on supers throughout the course of the season, especially if they're only extracting honey once a year. Um, so because if bees, if honeybees feel like they're running out of room in their colony, they'll, the, the, it's called swarming, um, yeah. the old queen will literally leave with half of the worker bees, and then the worker bees that are left over will produce their new queen. And this is like natural reproduction of honeybee colonies. But obviously for the beekeeper, you don't want half your bees like leaving um, or your like beloved queen. So, <laughs> so they are constantly like putting on space, you know, on, on the hive. So they know when there's a huge nectar flow because they're like, oh my gosh, there's no more space like so soon. I have a pesticide question. Sure. So my vegetable garden, um, you know, if I have the, the bugs, so last year I went and I got one of the organic sprays and I read because I didn't want to do anything before I read and it yep. said to that it, you shouldn't spray it like on the flowers because yep. it would be harmful to bees. Is it okay to use that on like the leaves? Yes, the like the best thing to do, especially like just organic pesticides can be almost just as toxic like as chemical pesticides, um, even though they're registered as organic. But um, the best thing to do if you do need to spray pesticides, which pesticides are an incredibly useful tool and like need to be used sometimes, um, definitely spray it on the foliage. Um, try to spray it like at night when the bees aren't going to be out foraging, and then it'll have some time to kind of, um, you know, there won't be as much residue when the bees do come. Um, and also maybe try to spray when, you know, it's not in bloom, even though that's not always possible, but it's best you, the best, do the best you can, you know. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, sure. For the bee lab collection, is what's like the protocol? Are there forms in there where you put your sample in and fill yeah. out? Yeah. Do you have bees? Yeah. Oh my gosh! Perfect. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, we have sample collection kits in there. Um, sample container for you, and then inside there's a submission form which you just put down all the information and you just fill it out. Um, and then there are instructions on how to collect them as well. Um, and you can just, you can take it like while you're here, you know, as many as you'd like. You know, grow accounts should be collected once a month ideally, but um, yeah, and then at your convenience, just drop it off and we'll have somebody deliver it to the lab. Um, yeah, and we usually put, uh, you can either use windshield wiper fluid or you have to kill the bees, which is unfortunate, mm -hmm. but it's for science. <laughs> <laughs> so <smiles> either, <laughs> so either windshield wiper fluid or um, like uh, isopropyl alcohol or something, um, you know, pour like a little bit in the container and then uh, you just scoop like a half cup of bees into there. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's really not in comparison to the thousands and thousands of bees that are in the colony. So, um, and you know, if it informs your, you know, if it ends up saving your colony, then that's a good thing. So, yeah, definitely grab some. Is there a schedule where they pick up? I think you said monthly. Yeah, it's, um, so it's on our website. I can't remember exactly what the schedule is. I can look it up, though, for you. Um, but it's all posted on our website. We have, uh, under the diagnostic lab, we have like an interactive map um, where you can look at all the different drop boxes around Vermont and it'll show you um, who the host is of the drop box and the, the pickup schedule and stuff. So yeah, so just visit our website and you can find out um, everything. Yes, it's so exciting. Um, and then the other question is, uh, if you don't, if your hive doesn't winter um, and you get a new one, should you clean like the whole thing out? Like do you leave honey yeah. in there? Like, it depends. Like, if you suspect that, well, okay, definitely if you've had a dead out, send a, send a sample. Ideally, send us a sample of, like, the cluster, not, like, dead bees at the bottom. Um, and we can be able to tell you if it's been, you know, infected with nosema or um, bromites or something. If it hasn't been diseased and it just, you know, the bees were stressed and they died over winter, you can absolutely reuse it and leave the honey in there for the next bees. Um, you know, if you install a nuke, um, you can literally put, I mean, it'll just bolster that colony. But, you know, if, it, if you do suspect it was diseased, um, definitely be aware of that, because that wouldn't be great. But, yeah, if not, definitely reuse it. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? How are the diseases of honeybees affecting the natural pollinators? Yeah, so my, so Samantha Alger, um, I think for her PhD, um, she studied virus spillover um, from managed honeybees to wild pollinators um, into wild bees. So it absolutely happens. Um, many, many of the pests and diseases are specific to honeybees, but a lot of them um, can transfer between you know, native pollinators and honeybees. 
And so what happens is that on a flower, you know, a bee will land and like it has a virus or something, um, and then the next bee, it's like touching a doorknob. Like, so yes, um, if a, if the honeybees are diseased, you know, that can negatively impact the wild pollinators, which is like so important. Um, why you know proper management techniques for beekeeping and and you know um, disease uh, treatments are so important. Yes. So many questions. Um, since <coughs> our honeybee was from Europe, mm -hmm. what was here before and what happened to it? Were I don't know if there was a honeybee in particular that was in the United States. I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay. Um, I know that there were, there are two, um, yeah, I don't actually, yeah, I, I'm not going to answer that okay. because I, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. I don't want to say a wrong thing. Um, Especially but I, you're being recorded. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like a lot of pressure. Um, yeah, I'm going to get back to you on the two questions. Yeah, good questions. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I just wondered, if, uh, I had read that the bees that are moved around are mm -hmm. more at risk of dying off, and I wondered, in Vermont, is it more native, or, or are bees brought in for pollination? Um, you mean, are they more like stationary beekeepers who are here, or migratory? Yeah. You know, it's a, I would say it's about half and half. There are a lot of migratory beekeepers that will um, spend the summer in Vermont and then travel to usually like Florida and other places like that. <laughs> Sounds like a nice life um, in the winter. So there are quite a lot of migratory beekeeping operations in Vermont, um, but there are also quite a lot of stationary beekeeping operations that overwinter through Vermont and just insulate their hives. Um, and the bees will, yeah, they'll make it through winter, typically. So I have been thinking about getting into bees. Yes. It's something I do. Yes, want to you do. absolutely should. Um, <laughs> is there, you know, is there preventative yes, measures for, for, for the, the like to avoid the parasite bugs and things like that? Is are, there a way to avoid it? Are there ways to avoid it? I mean, you know, it's tough. Yes, preventatively, um, there are ways to avoid it. Um, at this point, there's no way to avoid the introduction of varroa mites. Um, you know, a lot of bees, um, you'll buy them and they'll probably have one varroa mite in there. You know, even though the beekeeper is going to treat their bees right before they sell them to you, um, it's inevitable. So you are going to be faced with these diseases. Um, also, another disease that is quite common is nosema, and it's a um, spore-forming fungus that inflicts the digestive tract um, and causes dysentery and things like that. So that's just naturally occurring in the environment. Um, so the bees will pick it up. So these things, and it occurs in like moist environments. Um, so definitely like where you place your apiary can help. Um, you know, in like a more dry, sunny spot is good. Um, but in terms of varroa mites, you know, try to get bee stock that has been tested for hygienic behavior. Um, you know, really like do your research before buying your bees and get like locally adapted Vermont bees. Um, yeah, but in terms of varroa mites, it's almost impossible to uh, to avoid it, which is unfortunate. Yes, you should take a class. We're actually starting tonight as the first lecture of our baking class. But yeah, uh, to, like this summer would be a great time to like start educating yourself and then like order bees in the winter. Um, you know, to place your order in the winter, and then you can get all of your equipment ready, and then by next summer, this would be a great time to get your bees if you're interested. Yes. One, um, I spent probably 35 years in Vermont, you know, with three or four hives. Yeah. And absolutely the most interesting thing I've ever done here. I know. It's They're incredible. incredible. I know. I've been hooked. I started working here a year ago, and I like I can't stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so fun. So I had a lot of problems with there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people have had problems this year in particular, yeah. too. I've had a lot of beekeepers be like, destroy my... Colonies. Yeah, it's not a stereotype, like, bears really do eat honey, and they love it. They'll do anything, and, like, no electric fence will keep a bear out. If the bear wants it, it'll get it. Yeah, oh, yeah. You just bust right through it. He doesn't, like, bear doesn't care. <laughs> it wants that honey, which is understandable, but unfortunate for the beekeepers. Good? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.